Hi, Alan Stratton from Eswood Turns. I'm exploring the possibilities and potential of the infinite access chuck that uh, recently developed. And I also have some apple limbs not yet disposed of from my yard. So I decided to make this twig vase or bud vase. It is an eccentric turning uh, with different axes, although they're not totally offset like in some of them. But it, the key to this one, since I have a hole on the top for the, uh, uh, for the twig, was to make myself a little accessory here. This is just a tenon on a plug that fits into the hole that I drilled, but then that enables me to offset the end of, uh, with the tailstock and maintain pressure on the tailstock to provide a safer environment for both me and the wood. So this was essential for the uh, twig vase. I'll probably have some more practice yet, but for now, let's make ourselves a twig vase out of leftover pronings. The first order of business, as usual, is to fasten the limb to the chuck tenon. I'm using hot melt glue and putting an extra bead around between the tenon and the wood. Then putting a little pressure on it from the tailstock. I'm starting at the top of the vase to form the very top that will have the hole to receive the contents. With a small gouge, it does not take long to form the outer part of the lip. If I were to work from the bottom up, the spindle would likely break before completion due to the stress of the wood mass opposite the drive center. With the neck and lip still in a somewhat rough state, it's time to drill the top hole. I'm a bit nervous since the wood is hanging out so far without tailstock support. I'll drill carefully and especially avoiding lateral pressure. Whew, I made it without a disaster. Perhaps I should try a steady rest. Just a little more touch up. Now, just in case, I'll sand and finish this little section. This time I'm using mineral oil and beeswax for a finish. I'll never be able to exactly match this axis again. I prepared in advance a small scrap cylinder with a short tenon sized to match the hole that I had drilled. The tenon is long enough to keep the scrap from wobbling. Since the scrap is larger than the end of my spindle, it should give me ample opportunities to adjust the turning axis and maintain the live center support. Now for my first change of axis. I'm loosening the chuck and moving the spindle so that the live center is about one half inch from the original axis. Then tighten the chuck and start turning with a small spindle gouge. I'm careful to test the tool rest position before turning by rotating the spindle. While testing the tool rest position is important whenever turning, it is critical now in eccentric work. It is nearly impossible to position the tool rest properly without testing it first. And of course, sand and finish this cove section before continuing. Since it is only a small section, it does not take long and is much easier to do now. I'm making sure I move the tool rest so that I cannot trap my hands between it and the spindle while sanding. Now for the next change of axis. Loosen the chuck and live center, adjust position, and lock it all down again. My scrap tenon is working to keep the spindle steady, and test the tool rest position before going back to work with a spindle gouge. These small coves do not take a long time to cut. Then move the tool rest out of the way before sanding and finishing this small section. Time to change the axis again. Loosen the chuck and life center, reposition the spindle, and tighten it down again. It seems like it should be more involved than this, but this adjustment is actually easy. The difficult part is the creative part of choosing what angle to set the ax spindle axis. Then back to cutting the next cove. Here I'm trying to cut a very small shallow cove between the last two coves 
to add just a little more interest than a long section of natural edge bark, but I failed to position it exactly and the cove intersected the previous work instead of only bark. Oh well, better luck next time, sand and finish and move on. Let's adjust the axis and cut the next major cove, just as before. The scrap end tenon is doing its job. However, this cove is almost at the same axis as the last major cove. I moved it relative to the small cove, but should have moved it relative to the last major cove. Maybe, if I don't tell anyone, they'll think it is deliberate. You guessed it, sand and finish this cove. Next, reposition the spindle for the last section for the base of the twig vase. There's not much to cut here to round out the base. Before sanding and finishing this section. Now to part the vase off from the chuck tenon with a narrow parting tool. A small catch invokes a design change to shorten the base. But that's okay, it needed to be shorter anyway. With the spindle almost but not completely severed, I can break the remaining fibers by hand. Although I don't recommend this since they could tear out good wood. And the twig vase is finished. The scrap end block with a tenon to go into the vase neck worked to keep tail stock pressure. The principle is simple. Find a way to keep pressure and allow axis repositioning without consuming good turning wood. As for the vase, who's to say what an eccentric natural edge vase should look like? It's deliberately weird and draws attention to its weirdness. With that, we'll see you again next week with another wood turning video. Please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and tell your friends. Always wear your full face shield. Goggles are not enough. Until next time, this is Alan Stratton from As Wood Turns. <laughs>